Hey there, welcome back. Today on C Sharp and Sensors, we're going to look at knobs. Specifically, we're going to look at the rotary encoder. Let's go take a look at the bench and what I'm talking about. Here, I have a pretty standard switching knob. So as I turn it, it clicks and it's got discrete locations that it uh, rests in, and these locations just close a switch. This is not the type we're going to be working with today. Another type is the potentiometer. Now this one, it's a rotary knob, and I turn it, and it'll go all the way to one direction and stop. If I can get it to focus, there we go. You can see this one says it's 10K. So what I do is I can rotate it all the way to one direction, and it basically has no resistance through it. And then as I turn it all the way to the other direction, it's going to go to 10K ohm resistance through it. So this is, again, a potentiometer. And I'll do another video on how we use these from our applications. But today, what we're really interested in is this. This is a rotary encoder. Now, a rotary encoder has infinite rotation. So I can turn it either direction as much as I'd like. One of the other things you'll notice with these is they kind of have a bunch of detent, so as I rotate it, it's not smooth, it clicks. And this one, in fact, even has a push, so I can push it in. Might be hard to see, but it also has a click there. This is something that would be really common, like as a volume knob or something like that. Uh, my 3D printer has one for navigating through the menu. And on this, you can see we've got pins. It's got ground plus, so it takes voltage to drive this. It's got an SW, which is the push button switch. And then it has two others for the phase. And what happens as we rotate this, it generates pulses on these two so that something that's decoding this that is attached to it can determine what direction, whether you're going clockwise or counterclockwise. And since you get pulses for each one of these detents, you can actually see not just the direction, but how much it's moved in either direction. I think it's extremely common that the SW, the push button switch on these, goes to ground, but that is an important thing when we're wiring it up to know whether that connects to ground or to voltage. In this case, again, it goes to ground, and that will be important when we write the software for this. So let's go take a look at building an application that uses this sensor as an input. For this example, we're going to use the Yoshi Pi. Now it's important to understand that this is just a Raspberry Pi Zero with some other peripherals and some niceties, like not having to wire up the display and having screw terminals. You could run this exact same application directly on a Raspberry Pi Zero 2. You could run it on a Pi 4 or 5, probably even a 3B+. Plus. You could run this on a Meadow F7. Um, you could run this on a Jetson Nano. Anything that has GPIO effectively would allow you to run this. What we're going to do is we're going to wire it up, and I've already connected here. We have three digital inputs. Those are required. Two of them are for the phases of the rotary encoder. One is for the button. And then we have power and ground, and I'm driving this with 3.3 volts. And then it's connected just here up to the rotary encoder. So when I rotate it, we're going to get pulses on D0 and D1. And when I push this in for a click, D02 is going to drive to ground. Let's go take a look at the software. I'm going to start with an IoT Yoshi Pi application. I'm going to name this Rotary Encoder Sample. And this brings up our templated app. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to add a dependency to Meadow Foundation Core. That's going to have our library for the Rotary Encoder. Meadow Foundation has a lot of other peripheral drivers, but we just need this one right here, the Meadow Foundation. Now we'll come over to our application. We'll define a rotary encoder with button and create it here in Initialize. Now remember, over here, 
I had connected D0, 1, and 2. 2 goes to the button, and 0 and 1 are for the encoder. So I'm going to add these. You can see we have an A phase pin and a B phase pin. If we have these in the wrong order, what's going to happen is when we turn it clockwise, it's going to read counterclockwise and vice versa. So you don't really have to know which is which, just when you put it together, when you assemble it and run your application, if it's inverted from what you want, you can either change the code or change the wires. I just happen to know on this that if I use uh, D01 for the first and D00 for the second, it will be correct. Then we need to go one for the button pin. Lastly, it's asking for the resistor mode for this. In this case, I don't have an external resistor, and I know that when I push that button, it goes to ground, so I want a pull up. Once we've created it, we'll add handlers for a couple of different events. Clicked is for the button. And then rotated, we'll get an event for that every step of rotation. And it will give us the direction as well. Now we'll just implement these handlers. First, let's implement the click. We've created a display service up here, but let's store that as a member variable as well so that we can use it down below. Then we'll use this down in the event handler to display some text when the event occurs. I'm going to go modify the display service on this simply because we've got a couple of different things that might happen in quick succession. So we've got the rotate clockwise, counterclockwise, and click. So let's go over and adjust that service just a little bit. I'm going to add a timer in here that will clear the text of that label after one second. We're going to restart that timer every time we adjust the text. If it changes, we're going to set the text, and then we're going to reset this timer to elapse in one second. Because we're using the change event, or the change method on this timer, what will happen is if it's visible and the timer has not expired, it's just going to reset it for another second. So if we rotate a bunch of times, it's not going to clear after that uh, one second from the first event, it's going to uh, clear one second from the last event that it gets in. So now let's go back to the application and let's add a similar thing for the rotation event. Now here we're going to use this event that's coming in and you can see we've got the old and new value. And this new value is a rotation direction, so it's going to tell us whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise. So we can just take that, and I'm just going to drive that to a string directly. So that'll tell us either clockwise or counterclockwise. We no longer need the run method. And so there we go. That's our entire application for using this rotary encoder. Less than 50 lines of code. Let's build this and deploy it to the device. Now we can run the application. So you can see the text area here is blank. Then if I take the rotary encoder, let me put it somewhere where we can see it. If I push it, we get a click event. And if I rotate it, you can see we're getting clockwise and counterclockwise. And that's all it takes to use a rotary encoder like this in your .NET application. Thanks for watching.